an unbelievable program, and, and having all of you together with all of these wonderful characters is going to be a very special time. Once again, we only have 90 minutes, so we have uh, the clock ticking, but I, I welcome you to what I think will be a lively time because most of the people here really are representing agitators, reformers, they're change agents. They, they just were really bustling on, on, the, uh, on the move. They wanted to make life better for, for others. Uh, be they African-American or women or poor or disenfranchised. Each of the panelists will have six minutes, um, and Dorinda is right here keeping the uh, time clock, um, so we will move it along. And then at the end, we will have a chance to uh, welcome again Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, and Nella Roosevelt for their comments on, on uh, this particular cast of characters. And then we will have a final unmasking in the last very bit. Um, so we'll begin, I, oh, I sh we will follow um, according to the program, You're, the names as they're listed in the program, except you need to add at the end, um, after Susan B. Anthony, we'll have Carlotta Spears Bass, who is a very interesting figure, and I think you are like me, probably most of you had not heard of, of her, and uh, you will look, should look forward to finding out about her. So let's begin. Uh, with Victoria, now I think it's important when I'm talking about agitators and, and change agents to remember that um, that's with the exception of Victoria. Victoria was, well, she was Victorian and she represents an era, but during that era there were tremendous changes in the world and she ruled for 60 years and so I think she, even though she herself was not a reformer, uh, she certainly could claim uh, a number of changes uh, while the, the British Empire was still at its peak. So, well, she will tell you, she ruled, as they say, for 60 years, and uh, let me uh, ask you to welcome Queen Victoria. Uh, she asked that you all stand, but I, I don't know if you're going to do that. So, Queen Victoria, here you are. Sixty-four years. I, Victoria, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, Queen, Defender of the Faith, Empress of India, appear before you in this year of our Lord, 1887, the year of our Golden Jubilee. This is my first visit to America. Some years ago, during an audience with uh, Mr. Charles Dickens, I know that Mr. Dickens is a favorite of you Americans. He is one of our nation's most esteemed novelists, but he told me of the many strange manners and customs that he had encountered during his sojourn in your country. So I prepared for my visit by rereading his American notes and by rereading Mr. Dodgson's Alice in Wonderland. Happily, I can state that I have yet to encounter any strange or untoward manners on the part of your countrymen. Much has changed in England in the world since my coronation at Westminster Abbey at the tender age of 18. This was in 1837. I have kept a journal of my youth, as I was encouraged to do so by my mother, the Duchess of Kent, and the governess, my governess, Baron Lazen. I would like to read you just a brief entry from my journal at the time of just before my coronation. I look forward to the event which it seems is likely to occur soon with calmness and quietness. I am not alarmed at it, and yet I do not suppose myself quite equal to it at all. I trust, however, that with goodwill, honesty, and courage, I shall not, in all events, fail. Much has changed in England and the world since my coronation. 
Much more has changed. My country now leads the world in commerce, industrial development, exploration, scientific matters, and in the arts and letters. Truly, Britannia's ships rule the waves. My subjects comprise one quarter of the world's population. The peoples of India, much of Africa, New Zealand, and Burma share the blessings of our British constitutional monarchy. We have been blessed with very able prime ministers, in particular Lord Melbourne, our first prime minister, and the late conservative prime minister, Mr. Benjamin Disraeli, Lord Beaconsfield. England's peace has been marred by only one war, the Crimean War, that took place in 1853 to 1856. I only wish that I could share our country's triumphs with my dear, dear Prince Consort Albert. His untimely death from typhoid fever in 1861 at the age of 41 left me bereft of a loving husband a doting father of our nine children. England and I lost an able queen's private secretary and advisor to the crown. Albert's Crystal Palace Great Exhibition of 1851 was a resounding success. Why, 700,000 people lined up to view these wonderful industrial exhibits and commodities from all over the world. It is only recently that I have made many public appearances and fully resumed my public duties. I have, however, always been a dutiful servant. And after Albert's death in daily correspondence with my prime ministers, whether I've been at Windsor or at Osborne, or at Balmoral. God willing, I shall live to celebrate my Diamond Jubilee in 1897, and the turn of a new century, and that my reign will continue to see a peaceful and prosperous United Kingdom. You have today been a most kind and generous audience. The Queen thanks you. Thank you, Your Highness. Uh, 64 years it was. I apologize, but who's counting? Uh, next, we're going to move to uh, a gentleman, a, a, a guest from South America. Uh, this is a fascinating figure who uh, spanned the 18th and 19th centuries. And as you know, Spain had conquered um, a great deal of Central and South America and led frequently with a strong but often cruel hand. So onto the scene came Simone Bolivar, the great liberator, and I introduced him to you now. Please welcome Simone. I fully expected that I would have to surrender my sword at the door, and I'm so pleased uh, to still be able to have that in my possession. After all, this is one of the weapons that I used to liberate South America. These gloves are a little bit cumbersome, but when you're riding horses all day and going through brush piles up steep hills, trying to negotiate or find the enemy, with your 20 members of your warring group, all of them between 20 and 25 years old, trying to look for Spaniards in the distant hills, Spaniards of 2,000 strong. How do you conquer such a thing? My name is Simon Bolivar. I was born in 1783. I was a Creole, that means I had European background. We had plantations and we had been in Venezuela and Caracas many, many years. There comes a time when a country being subjugated to being ruled by an overpowering personage or country who rapes your land and then takes all of your crops in, in a very oppressive nature, there comes a time when you must demand freedom. 
I strongly believe two things, freedom, to free the people. And once you've set the people free to rule these people, not in a traditional manner, but the manner that I had learned while I was in France and Spain, and I visited America, and I studied Rousseau, and I found out that you need laws. Two things, you need freedom, and then you need laws to rule the country. Some people say of me now that maybe I was a dictator. That is not true. I was a fighter. I would ride my horse. The cavalry was a method of success in the Andes Mountains of the Western Columbia region. The Colombian region that I envisioned was to establish a new Colombia, a Northwest South American nation of all Americans, all of these people, Humboldt, who I had met and became a friend of, said that there were six kinds of people in Venezuela, but I always considered them Americans. Americans first, fight for freedom or die. Why did I say that? I wanted to free Venezuela. Why did I say that? The Spaniards ruled many years. When the rebellion was established about 1810, there was about two dozen of us trying to conquer a country. And of course, under Miranda and myself, we lost. The Spaniards didn't like these things, and so what they'd do is capture people, dismember them, drag them through streets. They had a nice dance, invited all the royalty in the neighboring towns to visit and go to a dance. And while the women with tears in their eyes were dancing on the floor, the Spaniards killed their husbands in their homes. What tragedies and atrocities that I had to endure. This is unbelievable. As a freedom fighter of Rousseau, I respected George Washington and the leaders of America. I had visited Washington and Philadelphia, etc., a little while. We lost in, in that region of the first battle of Venezuela. I had to retreat. I had to go to Jamaica, sit there and write letters to challenge the Americans to rise. Didn't have any money. I had one peso left. I was born into a rich family. My parents both died when I was three and nine years old. I was actually reared by uh, teachers privately. I remember one time I met one of my great teachers in, in northern Italy, and we sat on a mountain, and I vowed right then that I would free Venezuela. I also was widely read in the classics. I was actually a great orator by some people's standards. I actually uh, did pretty well at speaking and writing, trying to incite the Americans against the Spaniards. In fact, when I came back from Haiti, I had some financial support from the king of Haiti at that time, who was under a lot of other pressures and it was not really known, but I had some small barks and some schooners and we were going to land on the beach in Venezuela and hit again. But I did bring with me a very a favorite tool, a favorite tool for fighting rebellious natured people like us, a printing press. Because I wanted to disseminate the rule that us Americans deserve our freedom. And once we gain freedom, we want to maintain that with equitable laws. So quite often I would be called into battle. I had one occasion uh, to meet a very famous liberator of another part of South America, San Martin. We met in Peru. We really didn't hit it off very well. Not a lot is known about our meeting, but really secretly, he went to Argentina and Chile, and I had the northwest area of the New Granada or the Colombian nations. Towards the end, I was voted president all the time. I really didn't like that. I was just president long enough to get the governments established, and I would withdraw. I died at 47 years old, probably because I was uh, always active. I contracted tropical diseases a little bit, probably. Uh, it was very tough living conditions. I really never married, but uh, there were a lot of uh, ladies around at all times uh, between battles. So that was not a difficult situation. Uh, what really feared the Spanish people was our cowboys, as you would call them today. They were half-naked people who rode horses very fast. and did a real great job for us in the West. So the countries now that honor me are Peru, 
Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Panama. My pleasure to be able to speak with you this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Bolivar. Uh, be before the meeting, I didn't have a chance to explain the high technology that we have here at North Idaho College. Some of the members of our panel don't really understand about, they probably haven't seen something called a microphone, but they do have a choice between being here at the podium or uh, hand-holding this and wandering out among you. Our next, our next figure is a very puzzling, puzzling one. He certainly is a reformer uh, because he wanted to totally modernize uh, uh, Mother Russia, which was certainly a challenge. Uh, but his tactics were sometimes very brutal, and, and you, I would ask you to witness his treatment of his son and his wife, so here to explain himself is Peter the Great. Please welcome Peter. Sudari sudarini, dzień dobry. Ya Piotr Alekseyevich Romanov, Tsar Matushki Rasiya. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's a long ways from home. Tell me again, where exactly am I? It is a long way from home. Some people may know me as Peter, the cruel and ruthless ruler of Russia, who bonded with heretics and foreigners and who took down the holy bells from the holy churches of Russia and melted them into cannons in order to fight his wars. But for many Russians and for many others, I am the Tsar who literally opened the window to the West. I'm the Tsar responsible for developing Russian trade. And I am the man who also gave birth to Russian fleet and army. I was born in 1672 from a reigning father, Tsar Alexis, from his second wife. My childhood was quite extraordinary. I did not have a formal education. The education I could get was the priest who taught me Bible. I was not interested in that. I always kept asking people, how did things work? I was interested in knowing how the mechanical things worked. That was my interest. And I remember, <coughs> as I was young, my interest lay in carpentry and boat making. As I grew older, I went into learning about war tactics and army military techniques. As I reached the age of 16, my mother said, it's time for you to marry. And I said, find me a wife. She, and there she stood, a beautiful Russian girl named Yudakia. However, I lived with her only a week and left. Although later on she bore me a son, which would become the opposition of my party and would be, became the hope of the opposition of the old believers. I was not interested in why. There was a lot more things out there waiting for me to do. And <clears throat> shortly after that, Russia was in a situation when the country was very backward. There was nothing, no industry, no trade. And only West could teach us how to get trade into Russia. And what I did was I set out to the West with a great embassy. I even remember that a few days before that, we went to a party in the German suburb of Moscow. And Tsar Alexander Menshikov started laughing very loudly. People asked him, what is the occasion? What is the subject, your laughter? And somebody served him a salad. And there he stood saying, look, Tsar Peter Alexeyevich, they gave us grass to eat. Only cows eat grass in Russia. <laughs> That's how I set into Europe. I visited countries, Netherlands, England, Germany. I worked. I went as a, not as a king, not as a tsar, but I went as a worker, a common worker. I worked in a shipyard in Zandam, Holland. I used these hands, I used these hands to work with people, regular people, and that's what surprised the royal <coughs> nobilities of European countries. However, I had to cut my journey short. I came back because of the uprising of Strelsi, the national army that was founded by Ivan the Terrible. I won't forget, this was their second time, but I won't forget the first time they rose. They killed all the relatives from my mother's side right in front of my eyes and my mother. For that, I brutally punished them. I personally, personally chopped off the heads of several of the leaders of that revolt. They deserved that because they were trying to turn Russia back into old times. Still, that did not help the trade and I sent many, many young Russians, the sons of noblemen, clergymen, merchants to Europe to study all kinds of trades. And in return, I brought many 
foreigners, Europeans into Russia in order to help me build the industry. What I did next was <coughs> I went into war. I went into war with Sweden because once I looked to the west, there was this vast, there was the Baltic Sea, waves of which washed the shores of Ingri and Courland, the land that belonged to Russia some time ago but was lost during the times of trouble. And <coughs> in alliance with Denmark and Poland, I went into war, although we had a huge defeat under the town of Narva and became a subject to European laughter. Everybody laughed at my army and at my leadership. Later on, though, we succeeded in, prog in military progress and we reached the Finnish Bay. It was that day when I set a first stone to the building, building of the fortress of St. Peter and Paul. And that's where I built my capital, the second capital of Russia, St. Petersburg, and one of the most beautiful cities of Europe right now. It was then. What is this interesting mechanical instrument? Show me how it works. You should come to Russia with me, man, my friend. <laughs> so that's how it was. I always kept bringing new stuff to Russia because it needed the progress. I died in 17... 25. The last six years of my life, I was extremely ill. Although that may not have been the only reasons that contributed to my death, I still kept extremely partying, feasting, and drinking vodka. We shall not forget, at that time, the only things that kept a common Russian man going were three things. His black bread, his woman, and his vodka. <laughs> However, prior to that, four years prior to that, I was declared the emperor of Russia, the first emperor of mother Russia, and thus bring to the world one of the most powerful and influential countries of Europe, the Russian Empire. Я благодарю вас за внимание и дай вам Бог жить долго. Thank you, thank you, Peter. We can forgive you a lot of things. Um, as you know, we're today traveling through the, the world of history. The, our journey through time is taking us through the, the world of democracy. And one of the most difficult rights um, has the, to establish has been a woman's right to choose. Our next individual uh, coined the uh, phrase birth control, and uh, she was indeed a pioneer in every sense for population control, for a woman's to, a right to avoid unwanted pregnancies. And I give you now, welcome, Margaret Sanger. My name is Margaret Sanger. I'm the birth control lady. Some people called me nauseating slime. But I stand before you today, and in fact, some of you probably wonder why I am here on this panel of esteemed rulers, and we have makers of law, we have suffragettes. Well, I'm on this panel because I deserve to be. After all, I believe that a woman shall be free. Shall a woman be free if someone becomes her ruler? Shall a woman be free just because someone passes a law? Shall a woman be free simply because she's been given the right to vote? No. No woman shall call herself free until she can consciously choose to be a mother or not. That should be the first demand for women. Large families, poverty, and a lack of control over one's reproductive organs and life go hand in hand. And I devoted my life so that women, especially in the United States, would have the information in order to control whether or not they would become a mother. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my life. 
I know something about large families, about lack of freedom, about poverty. I was born in New York to a family of Irish immigrants. I was one of 11 children. My father, Michael Higgins, was a stone carver, my mother a housewife. They made a tremendous difference on my life. My father was a free thinker. He told all of us, always speak your mind and always think for yourself. My mother certainly had an influence on me. As I said before, she had 11 children. She also had tuberculosis. She was pregnant 18 times in 22 years. My only recollection of my childhood was of a childhood of things denied. The recollection of my mother was of a woman sick with tuberculosis, always pregnant. And in fact, I remember her holding one of her babies and leaning up against a wall while she was coughing in order so she wouldn't fall. She died of tuberculosis and she died of too many pregnancies and I knew that was not going to be the life that I was going to have. I had to bring up my younger brothers and sisters until thank God my two older sisters provided me with a college education far beyond anything I ever thought was possible. And there my life changed. I realized I did not have to suffer the same fate that my mother did. I began to become a debater. My defiant ways were channeled into leadership skills. I became a public speaker. And I knew I was going to do something with my life. And so I became a nurse. But in nursing school, I met my first husband, William Sanger. And in fact, William Sanger said of me, she's a born fanatic. <laughs> and we had a very comfortable upper middle class life together. Beautiful home. He was an architect and an artist. And uh, I had three children. But as time went on in this comfortable life of domesticity, I thought something was missing. And so I decided to do something kind of revolutionary. I went back to work, and I decided I would work with the poorest of women in the lower east side of Manhattan, the immigrants who had no other possibility for health care except somebody like myself, a home health care nurse, to take care of their needs. The women that I served, most of them had more than 10 children. They lived in one room. Many of them died in childbirth. They would take me and grab me and say, please tell me the secret to limiting my family. You know the secret. And of course, I did not at that time. Many of them suffered the possibility of killing themselves in order to prevent their pregnancies. And of course, we know that abortion is immoral. That is the taking of a life. But for women to get the information about limiting the size of their families was not immoral necessarily, it was illegal. I was not allowed to speak about controlling a person's uh, reproductive abilities. Many a time I was at the bedside of one of my patients and I saw a tear of joy come into her eye and whisper. A prayer, thank you, God, because her baby was born dead. How could she possibly bring another life into the world and feed it and care for it? A woman should not bring another child into the world unless she is mentally, morally, spiritually, physically, and economically prepared. I spent the rest of my life providing information to women, finding out information, opening birth control clinics, being uh, arrested, taken to trial, spending time in jail. These were against obscenity laws in the United States. 
And I think perhaps the crowning glory of my life was the fact when I was in my 80s, I was able to gather together several millions of dollars to allow people to research, manufacture, disseminate, and give, allow women the oral contraceptive pill that was safe, easy, and universal. Why do I belong on this panel? I think I've helped provide freedom for more women than any of these people ever could think of. And if you don't believe me, let me share a quote from one of my very intimate friends, H.G. Wells, who was a British futurist and historian. He writes of me, when the history of our civilization is written, it will be a biological history and Margaret Sanger will be its heroine. Thank you, Margaret Sanger, for all that you have done. And our next guest is also a charismatic woman. This is an itinerant preacher, preaching woman who just refused to be subdued. She demanded that poor and working women be counted as women also. And she's famous in our times for the phrase, and aren't I a woman? Please welcome the Libyan Sibyl, Sojourner Truth. Thank you. I am a person who has walked with kings. I have met with presidents. I have met many of the leaders of the world and many of the leaders of the country. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this so that you will understand where I came from and how far I have come. Most of the people today don't want to see this big black woman with the shawl and the cap coming their way. I had three messages that I wanted to give to the world and three things that I really wanted to change. One of them was slavery. I was born a slave to a Dutch family and I spoke only Dutch. I was, I am bilingual. I had many difficulties with the masters that I had because I was sold five different times. And each one of them spoke only English. I spoke Dutch and only a few words of English. And so it caused me lots of problems. I got lots of whippings lots of beatings, lots of punishment, because I really didn't understand, but no one believed that I didn't understand. Many people ask me how old I am. I have no idea about how old I am. It seems that the only records that were kept for slave families were boy, girl, and how much can we sell them for? So that I really consider my life began when I became a free woman. I became a free woman in uh, 1828. That's when I asked the Lord to give me another name. I was born Isabella. I wanted another name. So the Lord sent me the name Sojourner Truth. I wasn't satisfied with that because everybody else had two names. So I got down on my knees and I asked the Lord to give me a second name. My second name was Truth. That is the name that I carried with me until the day I died. I had an interest in women having the rights 
that everybody else in this country had. I had an interest in slaves being free. I had an interest in prostitutes becoming non-prostitutes. I had an interest in people who drank alcohol not drinking alcohol. So I went all over the country speaking about those interests. Interesting thing happened when I went to Akron, Ohio to visit the women's convention. I created quite a stir. There were people there who didn't want me to speak because they thought that their cause for the rights of women would be mixed up with slavery. They thought they would be accused of having an event that contained a lot of information about slavery. That is the speech in which I remember the phrase, and I said it often during my speech, aren't I also a woman? There, that was in question sometimes. I have a very deep voice. And a lot of people who wanted to speak against me often said I was a man. As a matter of fact, there was a doctor who came to one of my speeches and insisted that I prove that I was a woman. And do you know how he wanted me to prove that? He wanted me to remove my clothes and be examined by the women in the group to make sure that I was a woman. I told him that if he could take my clothes off, or anyone in that room could take my clothes off, then I would prove to them that I was a woman, but I didn't think there was anybody there able to do that. Once when I was speaking in Ohio, there were students in the group, and they were hissing and booing and thumping on the chairs and making a lot of noise. So I said to them, when you go to meet your maker in heaven, are you gonna have an answer for this question? Why did you hate colored people so much? That rather quieted them down. After a quiet pause, I shared with them, when I go to heaven, I will have an answer for my maker. And I simply started to unbutton the collar of my dress, removed my dress to my shoulders, and revealed a perfect patchwork of scars that had been inflicted by my masters. I finished my speech. I got a standing ovation from the students who were there. I'd like to leave a thought with you that I often leave, and that is that some people live scores of years and do not get past their infancy. I believe that anyone who has heard me speak, anyone who knows me, anyone who knows my causes, will say that I died a full adult. Thank you. Thank you, Sojourner. We're on a roll with these strong women. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was an abolitionist and suffragette. She worked all her life very, very hard for a woman's right to vote, and she felt that it was important for women to be involved in the political world, to be in the middle of politics. And her quote was, a good society needs women's views to complement to men's, a modest request. Please welcome Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I would like to know how many of you women voted in the last election. Please raise your hand. 
Very good. How many of you women out there have a career or maybe is working towards a career? Please raise your hand. Good for you. Now I would like to know how many gentlemen and ladies in this room are actually attending this college right here together currently, right now. Raise your hand. Good for you. You know, I wanted to go to Union College, but I wasn't allowed because they did not accept women. You know, they tried to do that in those days. They tried to separate the men and the women. The men were off doing their business, governing, they were voting, politicking. And the women, on the other hand, we had to tend to the children, we had to obey the men, we had to look ladylike. And we had to be careful not to step into the men's territory. And we weren't allowed to speak in public, not only in the mixed groups as well. I never quite understood. I always thought that we were created equal. And so, you know, everybody was trying to divide the world, and my quest in my life was to bring everybody together, and that's what I did. It all started in Johnstown, New York, and back in the 1820s. We lived in a little wide frame house. Actually, it was fairly big. It was the second biggest in the town. And it was in the center of town square, and a lot of action, a lot of activity, because my father, Judge Katie, owned a practice, and it was on the first floor, and so people were always coming and going. Now, the house was big enough for those who lived there, which would have been my sisters, myself, my parents, a couple servants, actually quite a few servants, but the nursemaid, we had some law students, and my older brother. Well, my older brother would only come and stay there when he was out of school. One day he came home from school and actually became fairly ill and passed away. I didn't know my brother that well, but I did know that he was the favorite child. He was the only boy, and so therefore he would be the only one to carry the Katie name. He was the only one as well to have a career. He was going to be a lawyer, possibly even a judge, but then he, he died. I remember going into the funeral and seeing my father sitting there, and I went and sat on his lap, and he didn't even notice I was there. And finally, he looked over and said, Oh, my daughter, if you had only been a boy. Well, I didn't know how to react. I couldn't. But I thought what I could do was maybe I could be as smart and as brave as a boy. So what did I do? I went out and I studied Greek. I decided to ride horses, and I was just going to jump high fences. And when I was at the age of 16, I won a prize in Greek, and I knew this was going to be it. So I ran home with my Bible that I had won, and I sat it down on his desk, and he sighed, and he said, if only you had been a boy. You know, I love visiting my father's law office. Sometimes he would let me sit in the corner and just listen to all his clients pouring out their sorry, their sorry stories. And I'd always just sit there, and I would get so angry because he was seldom ever to help the ladies. For instance, Flora Campbell, she bought her own family's farm with her own money. But then when her father passed away, or father, I'm sorry, when her husband passed away, he willed it over to their son. Well, his son didn't take care of it. And not only that, but their son was mean to her. But what could she do? Father said nothing. And so when she left the office, I was so mad, and I jumped up and I said, how can the law be so unfair? And so he calmly pulled out the big law book, set it down, and we opened it up. And we looked at the law, and I said, there is only one thing that I can do about that. I can cut the law out. So I started to do it, and he said, you can't do anything about that. Even if you cut out the laws, out of every book there is out there. He said, the only ones that can change the law is the ones who make it, and that would be the legislators, and they're all men. Another place I like to visit was my cousin Libby Smith. And her, Libby's father was a reformer dedicated to the cause of the abolition, that is the freeing of the slaves. In the Smith house, we talked about justice. We didn't just talk about obeying laws. And at this time, women were able to talk, and it was so inspiring to me. In the fall of 1839, a handsome gentleman named Henry Stanton was a guest at the Smith house. He took my breath away. Well, one day when we were riding horses, he asked me to marry him. And I said yes so fast that I don't even think he finished his sentence. 
but there was only one problem, and that was my father. Because see, Henry was 10 years older and he was an abolitionist, and so we broke off the engagement. But then he said in one of his letters that we would be going to London if we were married. Well, that didn't take much time to think about it. We eloped May 1st and we were off to London. Um, at the convention there, I met Lucretia Mott. She was a delegate from Philadelphia, Quaker, 22 years older. And she lectured on the abolition amongst women in mixed audiences. And one day when we were walking to the British Museum, we were busy talking and we were talking about the wrongs that women suffered. And we talked so much that we didn't even make it into the museum. We talked for eight hours. And we talked that one day, someday, we will meet again. And did you know it was eight years before we met again? I got busy. Women's rights became second in my life. Women's work became first. And I was sweeping one day. I was kind of depressed as I was sweeping. And I realized that men and women are not different. We are created equal. And each should decide our own sphere. And my sphere was not household chores, or no time to read, no friends, and no chance to feel like I was a person. In July 1848, I got an invitation from Lucretia Mott. And we decided at that time, there was five women, and we decided to hold the, women's, the first women's rights convention. I put a paragraph in the paper that said, convention to discuss the social, civil, religious conditions and the rights of women. We had men and women all over join. And after the convention was over and our declaration was signed, I had a feeling of peace and accomplishment. I had lost touch with that women in me and after the day, that day, I had found it again. I was able to go home and enjoy being a better wife and a mother. Now from that time, for 30, 40, 50 years, I spent lecturing, spent writing a book. My friend Susan B. Anthony was the energy in our force. We were a partnership and we worked hard for women to vote. I devoted my life to the rights of women I embarrassed my husband, my children, and my father. I was fighting when women weren't supposed to fight, and I spoke when I was not supposed to speak. Was it worth it? Today, seeing the men and women attending college together, seeing women working and having career, having self-worth, choosing their own sphere, Seeing you ladies and gentlemen here today, I think my father would finally be proud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, she was kind of modest here, and, and she didn't uh, brag about her seven children and, um, and say that she had to stay home while Susan B. Anthony, her friend, traveled around. But I did have a quote, quote from um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and in which she said, I forged the thunderbolt and Susan fired it. So our next, our next character is this friend of uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony. And she, uh, she never stayed home. She traveled all the time. She talked and she was always on the move. But just before the death of her friend Elizabeth, um, she wrote uh, in her honor, uh, that she doubted that, but they, she said that neither she or Elizabeth, in the hope and buoyancy of youth, had expected to leave their life's work for another generation to finish. But she harbored not a shadow of a doubt that they will carry our cause to victory, they being the next generation. Please welcome Susan B. Anthony. Yes, it's true. Mrs. Stanton and I had quite the collaboration. I would wheel her little children around in the wagon and she would write the speeches and we worked on books together, but that's in another time. I would like to talk to you about this year, 1873. What a year it has been. 
I'd like to thank the board for allowing me to speak about all the trials that we have been through, personal trials, legal trials. There are two groups of people who long deserve the right to vote, the Negroes and women. And instead of joining forces, unfortunately, these two moments, these two movements split. I would have liked to have been with you and had them hold together, but it wasn't it didn't work out that way. When the 14th Amendment came around and was added to the Constitution, it was a great day for the Negro man. But it was a severe setback for women because it actually said in the Constitution, male citizens. We were very disappointed. We had waited for the 14th Amendment and now it exclusively excluded women. But it was pointed out to us by a wonderful one of our delegates, Anna Dickinson, that there was also clauses in there that stated all persons born in, or naturalized in the United States were citizens. It went on to say no state may make or enforce a law which denies the rights of citizens. Ooh, what an intriguing interpretation. Then in November, I saw a wonderful ad it said, register now. Don't waste this time. Take the five minutes and register to vote. If you were denied the right to vote, you would fight for it. Lay down perhaps your life for it. So don't pass this opportunity by. I agree. Myself and 15 other, marched down, 15 other women, we marched down to the register's office with that 14th Amendment in our hand, and we said, we would like to register to vote. They snickered at us at first, of course, but then we took the amendment and we all analyzed it, and they could not find anything that specifically prohibited women from voting, and they registered us. And just to be on the safe side, because I was dragging other people along with me, I went and found a lawyer to speak to. His name was Henry Selden. What a wonderful man. He used to be a judge on the Court of Appeals, you know. He was a wonderful person to ask. And we asked him, what, I asked him personally, what he thought our chances were. How do we stand here? And he said he'd look over our papers and get back with me. And he did right away before voting day. He said, I believe you have a good fight here and I'll stand with you. Oh, we were so excited. So on voting day, we walked in and we cast our votes, and they counted. <laughs> we were so proud. We walked away feeling high and so, as the sky, walking proud. We had voted. We had paid tribute to our country. And on November 28th, it was one of the first Thanksgivings, you know, President Lincoln, he initiated this new holiday. We were arrested, <laughs> escorted down to the courtroom. We had a short hearing. I demanded a writ of habeas corpus. Basically, that means that show me what rule I have broken. Show me the evidence that I have actually broken a rule. And I was denied this right. Well, our, our trial was set for the summer. And so I had some time. So I decided to do some lectures and attend some conventions. Thank you for the speeches you wrote. Of course, every time I would leave the country, leave the area, the sheriff would get a little nervous and he'd see me off at the station and I'd just wave. He would nervously wave back. He knew I would come back. I wanted to fight this battle. I was also at this time, at this year, taking care of my sick sister, Gulma. She was very ill and I would spend as much time as I could at home caring for her. I think I overstressed myself and one time on the stage I collapsed while giving a speech and I was unconscious. I tried very hard to get a hold of my mother on the telephone. Aren't telephones wonderful? But I did not get a hold of my mother in time and the papers reported me dead. But I got a hold of her later and I told her it would be a while before they could report that story. Mother, do not fear. So the summer arrived and in the mass of reconstruction problems, I was told by the judge, Judge Hunt, that I would be allowed to sit during my, during my trial. I would not be allowed to speak, not one word in my defense. 
He decided this before we ever walked in the courtroom. He also decided that we would be guilty. I was guilty before he ever walked into the courtroom. Mr. Selden fought nobly. And when the time came for the jury to put their, ju their verdict in, he ordered them to give a guilty verdict. And then he did not even poll the jury to collect this guilty verdict. He just wrote down guilty. Why were they even there, I wonder? <sighs> then, at the sentencing, after not being allowed to speak at all, he asked me, were there any words I had to say? <laughs> well, I had not spoke for, oh, 20 years now on women's suffrage without having something to say about it. And then he had a little difficulty silencing me. And I finished everything I wanted to say. I was fined $100, and I told him to his face, I will never pay this fine. I owe people money, and I will not pay a dime of this, but every penny will go back to the people who I have honestly borrowed money from. But this will never be paid. So far, I have not paid it. And so far, they have not arrested me or done anything to get me to pay it. I think that's because they know the moment they throw me in jail, I'll be allowed an appeal. <laughs> Darn. Well, at the end of the year, I lost my dear sister. She lost her battle with the disease, and I miss her terribly. And I, I wish she could be here today. Well, she lost her battle, but we won't lose our battle. Women's rights is just on the move, and we are gaining strength every day. And with this wonderful crowd before me, failure is impossible. Contagious, isn't it? It's wonderful. And our next guest is another strong woman. Carlotta Spears Bass was the first African American woman to be nominated for vice president. And she worked for civil rights, for peace, for decent jobs, for equality. Please welcome Carlotta Spears Bass. Good afternoon. I was a civil rights activist in the early part of this century. I was also one of the founders of the Progressive Party. I served for 40 years as the editor of the California Eagle, and I was, yes, the first woman and the first person of color to run for vice president of the United States. Why have you never heard of me? Because myself and my running mate, Vincent Halliman, only captured 0.2% of the vote. <laughs> and therefore historians and political scientists consider us of no importance. So you've never heard of me. I was born in the late 1800s in Sumter, South Carolina during the Reconstruction period. In 1910, I moved out to California where I began working for the Eagle. 1912, John Nymore, who had founded the Eagle back in 1879, called me to his bedside and said, I'm dying, I do not want the Eagle to die you need to take it over. Reluctantly, I agreed to do the very best that I could. Little did I know that this would become my life. Later on that year, John Bass arrived and we were married, and quickly after that, our political careers began. When the book, The Klansman, was made into the movie, Birth of a Nation, I got the country in an uproar. They depicted black legislatures in hideous caricature and actually celebrated the violence of the Ku Klux Klan. To me, that film was heinous and damaging to black communities nationwide. Needless to say, the Ku Klux Klan later sued us for libel. My husband and I continued our work. We fought against the sentences given to the black soldiers during the race riots in Houston in 1917. We protested the police brutality towards minorities and also discrimination in the workplace. In 1934, my husband died, but I continued on. I became the national chairperson for the Sojourners for Truth and Justice, which had been founded in honor of my colleague. I also ran for the Los Angeles City Council. I ran for Congress, and I became the first black person to sit on a grand jury in L.A. County. I walked picket lines, I stormed city council chambers, I stormed the state legislature, Congress, demanding equal representation for my people. Many people referred to me as a militant crusader for minorities, and I was. 
I remained a member of the Republican Party until I finally went to a convention in Chicago and found out there was not one, but two Republican parties. The whites met upstairs, the blacks met downstairs. I left. That is when I went out and became one of the founders of the Progressive Party. That to me was the only party that had any hope for civil rights. In 1952, I became nominated by the Progressive Party to run for Vice President of the United States. In my acceptance speech, I stated, I am more concerned with what is happening to my people in my country than I am in rebuilding a decadent Europe or to repress the colonial people in preparation for a new war. I am sad to say that it is my government that supports the segregation by violence practiced by Milan in South Africa, sends guns to maintain a bloody French rule in Indochina, gives money to help the Dutch repress Indonesia, props up Churchill's rule in the Middle East and over the colored peoples of Africa and Malaya. I am here to change that. And let me go on further to say that I am better qualified to be vice president than either of the two people I am running against. John Sparkman is believed to be the new Harry Truman, and yet he voted against 26 civil rights measures. And Richard Nixon, he is the personification of all the evils of Cold War America. That man even signed a restrictive covenant on his home in Washington meaning that blacks could not live in his neighborhood. To me, that man is corrupt. Many people have also called me a communist. Let me set the record straight on that. When I traveled to the Soviet Union in the late 40s and early 50s, I saw many black Americans who had fled there in order to escape the repressive conditions in America. I saw black children and white children playing together and going to school together. There was no racism in the Soviet Union. I saw women repairing trucks, working on airplanes, competing with men in all industries. There was no gender bias in the Soviet Union. If that makes me a communist, then fine. For 40 years, I have been working as editor and publisher of the oldest Negro newspaper in the West. During those 40 years, I have watched the tide of racial hatred and bigotry against my people and against all people who believe that the Constitution is not just a yellowed piece of paper sitting in an archive, but is actually a living instrument, a working instrument for freedom. So yes, history may forget me. You people may forget my name, but remember this that today all colored people are on a battlefront against race prejudice. That battle must be won or democracy will fail. In this modern age, all minority national groups understand that this is so. We colored Americans can do our part to bring about a world free for all people by working toward that end now with our Jewish fellow patriots, our Mexican and Puerto Rican and Japanese fellow citizens, and internationally by working with all of our might for a world of equal nations, none excluded, working in harmony and freedom and peace. Thank you. Well, that was certainly a wonderful collection of uh, our, our guests from the panel. And now we want to invite uh, Mrs. Roosevelt and Mr. Lincoln and Mr. Jefferson to, to respond to the respond panel. Mrs. Roosevelt, could we begin with you? Would you uh, tell us what you think uh, about some of, the, uh, some of the comments, et cetera? Give us your response, if you would. We welcome you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I do want to begin by uh, speaking just a moment about a couple of the leaders uh, that might have not uh, benefited from showing courage. I think all of the people here today have showed a great deal of courage in what they have done. Uh, and I do agree with Mrs. Bass about Mr. Nixon. In my opinion, 
Uh, Mr. Nixon is an able and dangerous opportunist. Uh, since 1952, he has learned a great deal. He has learned that it is important to gain uh, the confidence of the people, and he has worked hard at it, and he has made progress. Uh, Mr. Nixon is uh, very adept at opposing something, and then when it is adopted uh, by his very own uh, party as part of the platform, he very conveniently forgets that he ever opposed it at all. Now, this makes me think that Mr. Nixon is a man of no strong convictions. Uh, the only kind of vision that he has is hindsight. <laughs> of course, then we know that Mr. Kennedy uh, wrote a book, Profiles in Courage. And I would only like to say about him uh, that it has always been a puzzle to me uh, that a man could uh, seem to understand courage and to admire it, uh, but should not have it himself. I should rather uh, say to Mr. Kennedy uh, that he should turn the other profile. <laughs> However, I do also want to say one or two things about the kinds of leaders uh, that we need in our country. I think we must have leaders, uh, not only in our country, but all over the world, who are not afraid uh, to take a position. Uh, you, so I, I think people's um, ability uh, to encourage uh, people to follow them, even though they may not want to follow them, as Mrs. Sanger has suggested, uh, she cannot be deterred. And so uh, you must show leadership uh, by leading uh, whether or not the people wish to follow you. I think that is most important. Uh, I am also uh, puzzled, as I have been for many years, over why we continue uh, to make such an issue of granting civil rights uh, to all of the citizens of our country. Uh, why is it necessary, I would ask all of you, uh, to spend so much time uh, discussing how uh, to extend those rights uh, to people who deserve them? I really don't understand why we seem to have so much difficulty with this concept. It seems very simple to me. Uh, I would also like to say that uh, we must understand uh, that leadership is not a charm. And we must have leaders who are not afraid to tell the truth uh, to the people of their countries. I think Mr. Churchill uh, was one who certainly uh, was able to tell stark, naked, cruel truths uh, to the people of England during the war. And we must all thank him for the leadership he gave at that time. Uh, I myself uh, have exhibited courage even sometimes when I did not think uh, that I was being courageous at all. Uh, for example, uh, Queen Victoria's relatives visited uh, Franklin and I, and uh, we took uh, some of them to Hyde Park, and we wanted to give them an authentic a picnic experience. And so, uh, we served them hot dogs. <laughs> I did not know that that was an act of courage. Uh, but I was soon to find that I was criticized from every part of this nation uh, because I had served the King and Queen of England hot dogs. But I must say, uh, Queen Victoria, that I think they enjoyed them a great deal. And I hope while you are here, you might be able to have a hot dog yourself. Uh, but I would like to close uh, by saying to all of you uh, that what we have witnessed here today among all of the participants is courage and the courage to tell us uh, what we need to hear, uh, whether or not we are ready to hear it. Thank you, Mrs. Roosevelt. And now, I wonder if we could have your comments. Mr. Lincoln, are you prepared? Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's been my pleasure to be here tonight with this distinguished cast of characters, some of whom my predecessors, many of whom my contemporaries, and a few of whom my successors later in time 
And I've learned something from all of them, and I envy you especially, Tsar Peter. You beheaded your opponents. <laughs> oh, there were times when I wished that I might follow your example. And I may assure some of those on the distaff side here that I advocated woman's suffrage as a matter of course as early as 1836. And I always thought that it was one of those happenings which in the fullness of time must needs come. And of course you realize that during the American Civil War, which was coterminous with my administration, we achieved the mightiest goal of all, the abolition of human slavery. And I pushed strongly for the adoption of an amendment to the Constitution to achieve that end legally and constitutionally, even though it was the war itself that brought that about. Those at the South would argue that the Civil War had nothing to do with slavery whatsoever that it had to do with a mean and oppressive government. I challenge anyone in this room to tell me how the government at the North, the United States of America, was destructive of the basic human rights of the South. I think the shoe should be on the other foot. Now you all realize, as I mentioned this morning, that when the Civil War began, it was solely a war for the Union, a war for the restoration of the United States, and it was not a war to abolish slavery. As I told the New York Herald Tribune editor, Horace Greeley, who was urging me to move more rapidly toward emancipation, I told him that my primary purpose in this conflict was to save the Union, and it was not either to abolish or to preserve slavery. I told him if I could save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save the Union by leaving slavery alone, I would do that. And if I could save the Union by freeing some of the slaves and leaving others in slavery, I would do that. Because my primary purpose in this conflict was to save the Union. But within a year, year and a half certainly, it became apparent that the Union could not be preserved without the abolition of slavery. Else, we would be right back to the situation which we faced in the winter of 1860 and 61 again and again. And I was urged uh, on my path toward emancipation uh, by some of the members of my own party who were called the Radical Republicans. I had more trouble with the members of my own party than I did with my opponents, the Democrats, the demagogues, uh, who were at the least predictable. But the radical Republicans gave me no end of trouble in my administration, and as you know, they even impeached my successor, the poor Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was a Democrat. He probably deserved it. But he was acquitted, and somehow the Republic survived. And so in the summer of 1862, I read a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation to the members of my cabinet. They urged me to withhold its issuance until Union fortunes on the battlefield turned more positive. And I took the occasion of the Battle of Antietam in September of 1862, a turning point in the Civil War. Five days after that battle, I issued the preliminary Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation, which made the abolition of slavery a goal, an end of the war. Now, I was criticized then, and I have been criticized ever since, for not doing more. The Emancipation Proclamation, one historian wrote, had all of the moral grandeur of a bill of lading. And I did not abolish slavery as a matter of basic human rights, though my personal preference was and always has been that all people everywhere should be free. I abolished slavery as a military necessity. And I would remind you that I had no power to do anything else. 
I had no legal power, no political power, no constitutional power to interfere with slavery in the states where it then existed. In fact, I had fairly won election on a pledge not to interfere with slavery in the states where it then existed. So the only way to attack that institution in 1862 was as a military operation to make the goal of conquering the South one with abolishing slavery and ending that institution. And I would say today, as I said this morning, that in the long history of the United States of America, the end of slavery, the abolition of human slavery, an institution as old as human history, is the most significant achievement of our country. It is the best thing we have ever done. And I would turn for proof of that proposition to the distinguished Americans who have joined me before this audience today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lincoln. Well, Mr. Jefferson, most of the uh, characters here today lived after your time. We would be very interested in hearing your comments on what they have had to say. May I share this mic with you? That's a microphone. <clears throat> well, let me say that I have been called by historians a creature of paradox, and I have never felt it so completely as I do at this moment. My favorite principle is that the earth belongs to the living and not the dead, and this is proof positive that this is so. As a, I was about to say that I am not accustomed to being in the presence of strong women, and it has been proved <laughs> yet again. You must understand that I am a creature of the 18th century. I am the sort of man you would find in a novel by Lawrence Stern or Jane Austen. And I was not prepared for the revolutions of the 19th century, however much I may have planted the seeds of some of them. And as I look at the panel here, I must say that I, I feel surrounded by two groups, those whom I disliked and those who have reason to dislike me. <laughs> Let me explain first. With the despots, Victoria and Peter the Great, I said once to George Washington, if you took all of the crowned leaders of Europe and molded them into one single individual, he would not deserve to be elected vestryman of the merest church in Virginia. <laughs> to think that you stood for Her Majesty, Queen Victoria, is shocking to an American sensibility. To think that Britain still has a crown in the age of revolutions frightens me. And that you would invite a benevolent despot, barely benevolent, despotic to be sure, to join you is more than my American sensibility can stand. I was, though, pleased to hear that Mrs. Roosevelt served hot dogs to the British crown. <laughs> it reminds me of something I said to the strongest woman that I ever knew, Abigail Adams. She was in London serving with her distinguished husband in the court of St. James. I was in France serving as the American minister to the court of Louis XVI, and Mrs. Adams wrote me one of the most interesting letters of my life. She said, how is it, Mr. Jefferson, that the British invented liberty but cannot keep it? And my response was, Madam, I find that it is not in their parliaments or in their churches that the British are to be reformed. No, it is in their digestive tracts. <laughs> The sheer quantity of animal flesh that this people eats renders them insusceptible of civilization. <laughs> so hot dogs perhaps are symbolic of just what the British are capable of in the world of cuisine <laughs> and health. So much for the despots. Now my friend from South America, let me say he is one who may have no good reason to honor me although I believe I can claim to be the parent of liberty on this continent along with General Washington. And although I played a role in the formation of what became known as the Monroe Doctrine, James Monroe, after all, was one of my protégés, it is the case, as I think you well know, that I had what might be called a stage theory of liberty. I do not believe that all peoples are equally capable of freedom. 
It seems to me that the South Americans are a case in point. When your peoples were beginning to assert their liberty in the second decade of the 19th century, I warned against attempting too much too soon because of people who come from a non-Anglo tradition, and particularly from a Catholic and a militaristic tradition, do not bring the same level of maturity with respect to rights that the Anglos have done. My stage theory said, there is only one people on earth who has ever understood liberty. Those are the Americans of English descent. Secondly, the British, although they have largely forgotten it, then the French, and then things plummet very quickly. And so I doubted that the South Americans were ready for a full complement of democracy. Better that they establish a kind of British-style constitutional monarchy in the short term, educate their young people for a generation or two, and then press for more reforms. And I'm sure you experience some of the same problem in your own country. As to the women on this panel, none of them can think well of me. I knew only two strong women in my time, and both of them were more than I could absorb. One of them was Mrs. Adams, who was the most intelligent, the most politically opinionated, the most stubborn, and the most sprightly of all the women that I knew. And I found, in fact, that to be more than my own Virginia sensibility enjoyed. And the other was Maria Cosway, a woman that I met in Paris. She overwhelmed me with all of that, plus she brought to our relations a fund of unapologetic female sexuality, may I say, uh, that was more than any Virginian of my time could have safely absorbed. <laughs> I said to her in a love letter that I wrote after she returned to England that my ideal woman, and I mean no offense to any of you, shows that softness of disposition, which is the ornament of your sex and the charm of mine. I do not expect votes of confidence after such a statement. There are, in addition to the women on the panel, Negro women. And here, indeed, I am at my absolute weakest. I cannot claim to be forgiven for my generation's inability to solve the problem of slavery or for the racism that was widespread in my, um, amongst my contemporaries, and may I admit, a racism that I shared some of myself. The only person on this stage that I can really claim to have admired me without reservation is President Lincoln. Um, it may be said that President Lincoln almost single-handedly rejuvenated my reputation in the Civil War. He said in several of his documents, including public ones, that if my Declaration of Independence meant anything, it has to have meant everything. And that if I contemplated that all men are created equal, I surely meant all human beings, irrespective of the accident of their birth, male and female, black and white and red, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, imbecile and genius. And it was Lincoln who, in a sense, teased out the universalism in the Declaration of Independence. Well, let me just say this. It may be that this paradox is an unsolvable one. In my time, I was considered one of the most dangerous libertarians and radicals that the world had ever seen. And yet in the time that came after me, my achievement has been measured as, in some regards, insufficient, in some regards, as pitiful. This much I would urge you. You may wish to dismiss me as a revolutionary. You may find me inadequate on gender or race or on peoples of other nations. But if you dismiss me, we have no quarrel. The earth belongs to the living, not the dead. But you mustn't dismiss the natural law which I articulated. In other words, I might be found wanting, but the principles embedded in the Declaration of Independence can never be improved upon. The natural law that says that every human being, irrespective of the accident of his birth, is entitled to two benefits in every great society. First. He is entitled to be treated identically in the machine of the law, irrespective of his origins. And secondly, he is entitled in every just society to a roughly equal chance at modest prosperity. My generation planted that seed. Your generations have attempted to bring it to fruition. I say to you, like the character in the New Testament, nunc dimittis, 
Now you may dismiss me. My work is done. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson, and thank you for coming from the great beyond wearing your own microphone. Uh, we have just one, one task, one more task to ask this group to do, and that is to go down the line and uh, take off, as they say, their masks and let us know who they really are in real life and perhaps what they have gained from uh, playing the characters they have played. Uh, shall we start with you, Dr. Jenkinson? You don't need to, to uh, necessarily uh, tell us what you have gained from, from being Thomas Jefferson, but we do welcome you here in both capacities. Well, let me be brief. There's a long line. Um, I'm one of the fathers of the modern Chautauqua movement. What I have gained is great delight in watching this movement proliferate around the country nowhere more completely than in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, under the guise of uh, Tony Stewart. And what I have gained personally by sitting here today is an enormous sense of the breathtaking progress of human rights. You on, Dean? There you go. Good afternoon. I'm Kurt Nelson. I've always found pleasure in characterizing another individual for this Chautauqua session and the ones in the past. Uh, the advantage is that students benefit by our study and our knowledge. If we study some external being, someone outside of our field, we always find surprises. And the surprises that you find are sometimes the threads that weave the history of the past. For example, the Declaration of Independence from my friend here, Clay, and Simon Bolivar, and the Age of Enlightenment was spread to South America. It was a little bit premature, but it took many years to fight the struggle. You'll find lots of threads that were commonly bound, quite old, way back to the Greeks. And it's wonderful to be able to study and put together all of these things to find out how you fit into this universe. Mr. Dickens, Mr. Dickens was correct. Today, I must say, I did encounter some untoward and very strange views. No. <laughs> My name is Denise Clark, and I'm a librarian here at NIC. Uh, why did I play Victoria? Uh, I haven't the foggiest notion, to be perfectly frank. I don't really care for Victoria much as a character. Um, I chose Victoria because of the period she represents. Uh, Victorian England was uh, an exciting time. Uh, I love Victorian novelists. I referred to Mr. Dickens several times because Mr. Dickens is one of my favorites. He was also one of the Queen's favorites. And uh, because she ruled during such an interesting time, I, I think it was as exciting a time and as tumultuous a time then as it is now. I, and so I was, uh, I wanted it just to assume her character because she is representative of a very fascinating period. Not because I find her a particularly sympathetic character, and certainly she's very far removed from the kind of women I enjoy playing. But with that. <laughs> Um, my name is Vivian Ward, and the reason that I truly, okay, this is honestly why I played um, Susan B. Anthony is because Tony Stewart was still my teacher, and he said, you will play Susan B. Anthony, and I had not received my grade as yet, and I said, yes, I will. <laughs> but I really enjoyed playing this character. She was an enormously strong woman, and I learned so much from her and her tenacity, her her perseverance. I try and think about her when I'm running, when I want to stop. And um, I am a mother, and I am studying to be a teacher. I am going to the U of I satellite program over here. And this has been a wonderful experience for me. Thank you. And my name is Trina Rungi. I'm a counselor here. And actually, I teach a class and also assistant women's basketball coach. 
Um, one of the reasons why I chose to be Elizabeth Cady Stanton is I think, actually, I didn't realize all that she had gone through. And I knew when I was young growing up, I remember when I was six years old and I said, Mom, I want to play t-ball. And she said, you can't play t-ball because girls don't play t-ball until they're eight or ten. You know, and again, it was like, well, why? I don't understand. You know, so some of the similar things, except Kate, Elizabeth Cady Stanton went through this, you know, her whole entire life. And I think just the strength that she had being torn from her family and yet what she believed in and stepping over those boundaries, again, speaking when she wasn't supposed to speak. Um, I just find a lot of strength in her. And, you know, definitely when it comes time to vote, I will definitely be out there voting for everything now, just, um, just for her. My name is Pat Johnson, and I work for the Idaho Education Association, and I live in Coeur d'Alene. I always have to tell people that because I think it's interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things that you can see by looking at the panel is that all of the men on this panel are very recognizable. We all know a lot about their history. We know a lot about the things that they did. That's not true of the women that you see here on this panel. We may have heard their names, but they're not in large measure in the books. They're not in large measure the people that we study about. So that I was really pleased that we had so many women represented here today. Hi, my name is Mona Klinger. I'm an instructor here at North Idaho College. And um, I got into Margaret Sanger, I think because uh, in the Popcorn Forum Committee, we looked at, it was at uh, Life Magazine and the great people of the millennium, and Margaret Sanger was one of the top women. But in the whole millennium, of all the people they mentioned, how many women, Dorinda? Six. And that just kind of amazes me. And so she was one of the top ones. Um, I really don't admire Margaret Sanger as a person. She had a very wild life. We'd like to get into that a little bit. Um, so I didn't admire her as a person, but I am the beneficiary of her work. And I think my daughters will be the beneficiary of her work, as many of our students. So that I have to say thank you for. I'm Susan King from Tulsa Community College in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I'm finishing my 23rd year teaching. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt is one of seven historical characters that I portray. People always ask me who is my favorite, and it's really hard to choose, but I agree with Pat. Many of my characters are fascinating and wonderful, but you've never heard of them. Um, and so I think that's a great tragedy. Of course, Eleanor Roosevelt, you've all heard of, but I don't think you really know her very well. And so I enjoy the opportunity to bring to you a woman who we admire, and when you study her, we realize that she deserves to be admired. She was truly an amazing woman. And she was also a liberal. And I think that in studying Eleanor Roosevelt, I have uh, discovered that I myself need to be prouder of the fact that I'm a liberal. Sometimes now you feel that it's not something you would necessarily tell people. Um, but she was a liberal. She thought that women were natural liberals because we all want the future to be better for our children. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amelia Phillips. I used to teach here as a member of the adjunct faculty. I'm now full-time over at Spokane Falls Community College. Um, I chose Charlotta Spears Bass because an elderly white woman that I knew over in Newman Lake, uh, who I called Grandma Little, called me into her room one day to show me an article of a woman who had run for vice president back in 1952. And imagine my surprise when I sat down in her bed and saw an article about a black woman. And I'm like, I had never heard of this. And so when Tony asked me to participate this year, I said, that's who I'm going to be. And it was especially eye-opening for me because she's the same um, age as my grandparents. 
My grandparents were born in 1880 and 1884. She was born in 1890. So it's just amazing to see what they had to go through. My name is Murad Khalif, and I'm an international student here on campus at NIC. Uh, I come from Turkmenistan, one of the former Soviet republics that comprised the whole country. My country has been the part of Soviet Union for about 70 years and part of Russian Empire for about somewhere 20, 30 years prior to becoming a Soviet state. I chose the character of Peter the Great because I find my story to be a little similar to his story. My country, after um, being a communist state, is in process of getting into democracy and it's a hard situation right now and many students from Turkmenistan are studying abroad in Europe, United States, so I'm learning, to, I'm learning democracy, I'm learning the market and free society, so that's what I'm planning to bring home. And um, this is my first time I'm doing this popcorn form speech and I really enjoyed it. And uh, I love this town, I love the area, and I love people. This, this ends our journey for today. Uh, would you give one more round of applause for our panel? And applause for you, too, as an audience. It's been a wonderful time. And don't forget that Dr. Jenkinson will portray...